It's on the Sabbath day. And he gets the scroll from the prophet Isaiah and opens up that scroll to Isaiah 61 and verse 1. And Jesus here in Luke's Gospel is quoting that scripture from Isaiah. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Sister Seth brought a wonderful message on preaching and anointed to preach. And then it continues on. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and that is what we're doing this afternoon. The message this afternoon, the anointing, he has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. Now remember, the life of Jesus, it is a pattern, it is an example for us. He was baptized in the River Jordan we are to be baptized. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the dove came down at the baptism and rested on Jesus. And God wants us to know the anointing of the Spirit of God. And for that anointing to increase and to increase. And one of the purposes of that anointing, Jesus mentioned here, he's anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. People today are wounded, they're hurt, they're captives. Many people are in captivity, they're captives to sin, they're captives to all kinds of things, to alcohol, to drugs, to immorality. They're in, the, they're in bondage, they're in many bondages. And the devil has entrapped many, many people today. And God is raising up, you and I, he's raising us up so that the anointing can come upon us, the anointing of the Spirit of God, that you and I, by the grace of God, might be deliverers. He wants to anoint us, each one of you, to be deliverers. But often when I talk about deliverance, you know, we must, if we're going to set the captives free, if we're going to be anointed to set others free, obviously, we must be free ourselves. If we are not free ourselves, if there's bondages in our lives, how can we set the captives free? How can we be deliverance to those who are captives? So God's purpose is to anoint us, to bring deliverance, to set the captives free. But of course, in order, to that, in order for that to happen, we must be free ourselves. And Jesus said, John 8, 36, He that... If you shall have... Uh, John 8, 36... Uh, John 8, 36. Somebody read it. If the sun shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. If the sun shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So, Jesus wants us to be free. It's the will of God. Every one of us is free and that we are free indeed. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And then, of course, when we're free, we're called to be anointed so that we can, in turn, set the captives free, set those in bondage free, and not in our own strength, not in our own power, 
We can accomplish nothing but by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to the help of suffering humanity, working miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons or evil spirits. And throughout the three and a half years of his ministry, this never changed. And so many people we read about in Matthew and Mark and in, in, in Luke, uh, in the Gospels, were delivered by Jesus of evil spirits. And Jesus wants to deliver us from every bondage, from every oppression of the devil. That is the will of God for each one of us. And as we understand the legal defeat of Satan at Calvary, every believer, God wants each believer to have authority over demons, over evil spirits, because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of his great victory for us on the cross. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus. Remember, he is our pattern. He's our example. God anointed Jesus with power and the Holy Spirit who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. In other words, those who were bound those who were in bondage. And very early in the ministry of Jesus, there's a direct encounter with Jesus and an evil spirit. And in Mark's Gospel in chapter 1, Mark's Gospel chapter 1, we see this encounter. And here Jesus, it is towards the beginning of his ministry, and Jesus is in the synagogue in Capernaum. And again, it's a Sabbath day. From Nazareth, Nazareth, of course, is in Galilee. Jesus came down to the Sea of Galilee and he came to Capernaum, which is on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. And verse 21, he entered a syn the synagogue on the Sabbath day, on the Saturday, and he taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, at his doctrine, because he was different than the rabbis and the scribes. He taught them with authority, not as the scribes. And there was in, verse 23, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And this man cried out, well, the spirit, the evil spirit cried out through the man, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Aren't you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. He had revelation. That demon had revelation. But it was not revelation from, the, from God, from the Lord. It was revelation from Satan. And he recognized Jesus was the, the Savior. He was the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him. And Jesus said, Hold your peace. Be silent. Come out to him. He was not speaking to the man. He was speaking to the demon that was in the man. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out. The spirit came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned amongst themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region round about Galilee. In this account... One of the first accounts in the gospel of Jesus casting out an evil spirit, a demon. Jesus, he dealt with the demon. He did not just deal with the man. He expelled the demon 
from the man. He did not expel the man from the synagogue. Jesus was, he was not embarrassed in any way by the interruption or by the disturbance about that man calling out. Dealing with demons was, was, was an integral part of the ministry of Jesus. When you talk about the ministry of Jesus, Jesus preached, Jesus taught, Jesus healed the sick, Jesus cast out evil spirits. I mean, and that happened over and those, those four, they happened over and over and over again in the ministry of Jesus. And in the same way, God's called us to preach, to share the gospel. He's called us to teach. He's raising up many teachers of righteousness. He's preparing many of you to be teachers of righteousness and go forth all over the Philippines and other nations. But he's also called us to the supernatural, to heal the sick and to cast out evil spirits. Now, this demon spoke in both singular and plural forms. It said, let us alone. So this man had more demons than one. He had, he had, he had many, de many demons, plural. There was a plurality of demons. Sometimes someone has one demon, sometimes they have two, sometimes they have three, sometimes they have many hundreds. And this, the demon spoke in singular form and plural forms. In other words, one demon was speaking, but that demon was speaking on behalf of, of the other demons which were in that man. Now, it's reasonable to assume that this man was a regular member of the synagogue. You know, sometimes when we think of a person demon-possessed, we think in our minds immediately of the account in Mark chapter 5 and the demoniac and the person who was the man who was completely deranged, his mind was, he had no reasoning, no intellect, he had great power, they had to chain him down, he was naked, he was in the tombs. And sometimes that's the image we think in our minds about someone who's demon possessed. And there is truth in that. And I've seen people in that condition who are like that. But also, the many other people who are, in many ways, they're very ordinary people, they're part of society, they go to the synagogue or they go to church, but yet there's an area of their life where they're not free, where there's a bondage. And it can be likened like this. You know, here in this building, there's many rooms. You know, upstairs there's the girls' dormitory and then there's downstairs, there's guest room where we're staying and there's, there's the offices and there's Pastor Norman's and Sister Linda's apartment. There's, there's many rooms in this building where we are now. Now, just imagine, you know, everything's nice and ready for a seminar and it's all been cleaned and swept and the students were busy last night and getting the chairs all arranged again and neat and tidy. But if, if all the rooms in this building, if they were all nice and neat and tidy and clean, but just think, there's one room, there's one room, one room in this building, and it's just a mess, there is junk, there is rubbish, there is garbage, it smells, and da-da-da, and that, you would just sort of lock that door and, and close it off. Now sometimes, that is, that is like many Christians. They love the Lord, they're saved, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they, 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 they love Jesus, but there's one area of their life, like one room, many, and many, many parts of their life, they're fine, they're, they're, they're normal, they, they go to church, they're, they're involved in the work of the Lord, they even witness and are used of God, but there's a problem. 
there's a bondage. It's like one room. It's one part of their, their house. One part of, one area of their lives. There's a deep bondage. And that, maybe that bondage, maybe it's rejection. Maybe it's envy. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's rebellion. And there's an area in their life where they are not free. They're not free. And the Lord wants to set the captives free. They're not, they're not what you would call possessed. They're not totally owned by demons. No. But they're, they're like those that a demon has a control. They're demonized. Or a demon has a control of some area of their lives. And many people who received help from Jesus were normal, respectable, religious people. But some of them were demonized. Or, and I, and I use that word demonized, in other words, that they had a demon. It's not, it's not as if they're totally possessed, like that, that, that demoniac who had you know, no control whatsoever and just had, you know, just uh, his mind was gone and he just, he was fierce. He had no clothes. He had supernatural strength. But there's people who are, they're fine in, every er in, in, in most areas, but there's one or two areas where they are not in full control. And somehow, a demon has gained access into their lives or personality. Many times, Jesus, we read, he went out and at even. He healed the sick. He cast out the evil spirits. And not only did Jesus do it himself, he sent out his 12 apostles. He says, go out, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out evil spirits. It was his commission to the 12. And it was his commission also to the 70. He sent out 70 disciples. He said, go out, preach the gospel to the poor, heal the sick, cast out evil spirits. So he himself, that was part of his ministry, his followers, those he was training up, the twelve, he sent them out also to cast out evil spirits. Now evil spirits or demons, they have personalities. They do not have a body, but they desire to be in a body. And when, those, when Jesus was casting out those many evil spirits out of that demoniac in chapter 5, in, in, in Mark's Gospel in chapter 5. The demons pleaded with him that they would be cast into the body of those pigs. And Jesus agreed to that. And those demons in that man were cast into the pigs, and then the pigs, they just ran towards the cliff, they fell down this high cliff, and they drowned in the Sea of Galilee below. And all the owners of that village and the owner of that pigs, they were more interested in their finance and their profit from the pigs. And they didn't want Jesus to stay. They wanted Jesus to go. But the demons came in. The demons would rather be in a person, but if they can't be in a person... They'd rather be an animal than, than not having a body at all. And, you know, even things like, like animals and dogs can be, can be possessed with demons. Animals, like those pigs, were possessed with demons. So they are bodies that they, are, they, are do, they do not have a body, but they desire, they do not have a body, but they desire to be in a body. In the early church, we see the ministry of deliverance. We see the ministry of deliverance in the life of Jesus. He was the greatest deliverer. He was anointed to set the captives free. And then Jesus trained the twelve, and he sent them out to bring deliverance. And then Jesus, with the seventy who followed, he sent them out to preach, to heal, to cast out evil spirits. In Acts chapter 8, after the day of Pentecost, Philip went to Samaria. Philip had revival. People got saved. People were, he, 
baptized in water, and then many demons cried out, and Philip cast them out, and they were cast out. And it says they came out with a loud noise, much, you know, crying, screaming. Acts 8, verse 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul, he had an encounter in Acts chapter 16 with a woman, and she had the spirit of divination. It was a demon of divination. Through this demon, she could tell the futures of the people, predict the future in their lives by an evil spirit. And the masters of this woman, they got much financial gain from this. In Acts chapter 19, we see again the, 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 the ministry of deliverance in the Apostle Paul. He cast out uh, many demons. We see the ministry of deliverance affected, you know, the entire community. And we read about the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19. And they thought they could go round, you know, preaching, you know, in the name that Paul preached. They were itinerant Jews. They were exorcists. And, 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 and the demons of this man, they leaped on these sons of Sceva. And they, just, they ended up running away naked. They were overcome by the demons. And so in the Gospels, we read much about deliverance. In the book of Acts, many times we read of deliverance. Now, you know, some, we need revelation, we need understanding by the Holy Spirit, but not all sickness, the cause of sickness can be from many different, many different ways. You know, some, some sicknesses, you know, are hereditary, are passed down. You know, some sicknesses are because of, you know, we, we, we don't take care of ourselves, we don't you know, take care of our bodies, and that can result in sickness. There can be many causes, different causes of sickness. But sometimes sickness is a result of a demon, of an evil spirit. And in Luke 4, in verse 40 and 41, it's clear that many of the sicknesses there were caused by demons. In Matthew 9, and it speaks about a dumb man. And Jesus rebuked that, that spirit of dumbness. In Matthew 12, it speaks about a blind and dumb man. He had a blind spirit. In other words, his blindness, it was caused by an evil spirit. And Jesus cast that spirit out and he was able to see. In Luke 4, when Peter healed, he, when Peter rebuked the fever of his mother-in-law, he rebuked that fever. In other words, he spoke to that fever. Now, you don't speak to something like a, a, a piano or a chair, an, an inanimate op object. Obviously, when Peter spoke to that fever, he was speaking not to the woman, not to Peter's mother-in-law, but to the spirit within her causing that that fever on that occasion. It was the demon that caused the fever. In Luke 13 and verse 11, there's a woman, she's all bent over, and she cannot, she cannot straighten her back. She's all bent over. And the Bible says it's a spirit of infirmity. A spirit, an evil spirit of infirmity. Today we would probably call it spinal curvature. But, in other words, her physical condition was caused by an evil spirit. And in the same way, sometimes cancer, epilepsy, arthritis, asthma, and other sicknesses can be caused by evil spirits. Now we come to the question, the next question is, how, how, do, how do evil spirits enter? How do they, how do they enter? How do they gain access into human personalities? Well, often they come not by our sin, although that is also a cause, 
But often things can be passed down from the generations to the third and the fourth generation. When we read about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and we talk about the sins going down to the third and fourth generation. And in other words, we can inherit generational iniquities from those in our family background. If a father is involved in idolatry and an idol worship, he can have a son. And his son at birth can have a spirit of, of idolatry at birth. Not because he's committed any sin himself, or not because that little baby has not worshipped idols, but he's inherited that. It's passed down to the next generation from his father, who was an idolater. And so people can grow up, for example, a man with spirit of idolatry. He's born with that. He grows up, later on he receives Jesus, he's born again, then he's baptized in water, then he's filled with the Holy Spirit, speaks in tongues. And in many ways, you know, he's doing quite well. But there's an area of bondage in his life, because one area, one part of his life, as it were, he's got that spirit of idolatry. It's not his fault, it was because of his generations because of his father and so but if that person if that man is going to be free he needs that spirit to get rid of that spirit of idolatry for the for the spirit of idolatry to be cast out otherwise he will not be completely free and Jesus said if the son shall make you free you shall be free indeed indeed let's say it together if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In other words, completely free. If a, mother is a, if a, if a man's a witch doctor, often his son, his daughter, can be born with a spirit of witchcraft. And it tells us in Exodus 20 verse 5, that can go down to the third generation and the fourth generation. So in other words, the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, and the fourth generation is the great-great-great-grandfather. In other words, even something from our great-great-grandfather or our great-great-grandmother can come down to us. And there's, there's, there's a number of scriptures in Exodus and Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel and Leviticus which speaks about things coming down from generation to generation to the third and the fourth generation. If a mother has been in witchcraft or there's been a family background in the occult, often her child, even from birth, has a spirit of witchcraft, even though the child has not sinned in that area. So those inherent weakness. You know, in our we can you know in our in, in our in our lives, such as sometimes because of the generations, your father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, we can be born with a weakness in certain areas. Maybe a weakness such as alcoholism, such as heart disease such as mental disorders, because they can be passed on and inherited by the children. If the father's an alcoholic, often you know, his son ends up an alcoholic. If a mother dies at 40 years because of a heart condition, sometimes her daughter will also die about the same age with a similar problem. Now, there's no... There's a balance here. We can't use this just as an excuse because you know, every man is responsible for his own sin. But nevertheless, people can be born with weaknesses in certain areas and sometimes with evil spirits because of our forefathers. What was David's problem? He ended up in lust. He ended up in immorality. What's David's generation? Who is David's... What was the name of David's father? 
Jesse. Jesse. What was the name of Jesse's father? Obed. What was the name of Obed's father? Boaz, who was the husband of Ruth. What was the name of Boaz's father? <laughs> Bible school students? Salmon. And Salmon, who was Salmon married to? Rahab. Rahab. So if we go back four generations in David's life, there was Rahab. What was her problem? It was Rahab. She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And so even four generations later, you know, David, you know, there was a weakness. There was a weakness in that area. And that can be in many other, you know, uh, people are, can be in, in, you know, alcoholism or, or, or whatever. You know, many babies today, you know, they get aborted. They die. Some survive abortion and are born with a spirit of rejection. And others, they have a normal birth, but the mother did not, does, did not want them. And from birth, when that child is born, it's already born with a spirit of rejection. One lady I prayed with in New Zealand, I prayed with her for deliverance, you know, for, for a spirit of rejection. And she was saved, she was filled with the spirit, but she was not free. And her mother had said to her when she was a little girl, I never wanted you. I wish you'd never been born. What a horrible thing for a mother to tell a daughter. I wish you had never f f been born. You know, how hurtful. And so there was that spirit of rejection and that spirit of rejection right from, right from birth. And we, you know, I, I got her to renounce that, to forgive her mother, and we prayed. And then we stood against that spirit of rejection and I commanded it to leave and we, we, we prayed and she got a wonderful release and she was a, you know, God, God just transformed her. She was a changed person. And it was just that spirit of rejection because she had not been wanted by her mother. I was praying with another pastor in New Zealand and there was... A woman who was manifesting as this demon spirit, but she was she was not getting delivered. So we stopped and we talked with her, and then she said, "Would you pray? Would you pray against a spirit of death?" And she told us when she was still in the womb that her mother had tried to have an abortion. But that abortion did not work, and she was born. And so, when she was born, while she was still in the womb, it was like a spirit, a demon of death, entered, entered in. And so, we prayed again, and then we prayed again, again, against the spirit of death that she had. And God was merciful, and she was set free, and there was a wonderful change in her life. My wife shared yesterday about the lady she played, prayed for with that abortion. And, you know, confessing it, acknowledge it, confessing it, you know, as, as murder. And abortion is a terrible thing in many countries today. In America, since 19... since January 1973, when abortion was legalized, more than 50 million legal abortions have been performed in the USA. Lives that have been murdered. I mean, can judgment be averted? In the area of the occult, one of the major ways demons have gained access to humanity is in the occult. Many of the villages in Africa, India, 
you know, they have the witch doctor. Western cultures, they have the cult and the occult and other forms like horoscopes, psychics and so on. And so many today are ensnared by their evil, deceptive, satanic power. The occult, it comes from a, a Latin word, concealed, concealed, or covered over, hidden, concealed, covered over. And the power operating through the occult, it is evil, it is not from God, it is satanic. And a branch of the occult is divination, and divination gives us knowledge of things through satanic means. That woman in Acts 16 was a spirit of divination. She said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One. You're a Holy One of God. Speaking and talking about, uh, about the Apostle Paul. She had that revelation. It was by, from Satan, not from God. It was correct. But it was, it was from the enemy. Divination. There's also fortune telling, psychic predicting, extrasensory perception. And that spirit of divination in Acts 16 was a demon by which she predicted the future. In the margin of my Bible, it's got a spirit of python. And a python snake. We know a python, a snake, is a, is a picture of Satan, of demons. We would say today a person is psychic. And, you know, this slave girl in Acts 16, she was delivered. And she believed in Jesus. And she was the first person in Philippi, you know, to discern the identity of Paul and Silas. Yeah, these men are the servants of the, of the Most High God. Everything she said was true. But her knowledge about them came from, came from a demon. And when the demon was expelled, when Paul cast that demon out, she could no longer have that power. She could no longer predict the fortunes of people. And those who were in control of her, they lost a lot financially. And then they, they stirred up an uproar in the city. They threw Paul and Silas into jail. And then in jail, they were, they were beaten in jail. You know, just because things go wrong, it does not necessarily mean you are out of the will of God. Paul and Silas were in the very center of the will of God. And it's like everything went wrong. They were beaten. They were hurt. They were, they were feet were in stocks. And they were held in prison. But what did they do? They began to sing and praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Delight on anger. Oh. And as they praised the Lord, God did a miracle. And the doors swung open. The jailer, you know, he was going to kill himself because he thought he was responsible and everybody had gone. And he says, and, and Paul said, don't kill yourself. And then he cries out, you know, what shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. In the sorcery, you know, that's like a branch of the occult and often associated with drugs and potions and charms and amulets and magic spells, incantations. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy 3.13. Seducers or impostors. In the Greek it's literally enchanters. And used, you know, incantations are used in various occult rituals. And it came to mean wizards or sorcerers. And some contemporary forms of, of music. A lot of you know, hard rock, acid rock, and so on can be used as channels of supernatural satanic power. Just as music, as we've been experiencing in every meeting in this, in this seminar, godly music has lifted us up. 
into the presence of God. And as we've praised the Lord and worshipped the Lord, you know, it's just been wonderful. We've All of us have, have felt that touch of, of the presence of God in our midst. It's lifted us up in wonderful crescendos. And then higher realms again. Isn't the presence of God so wonderful? Amen? Amen. 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 But wrong music can be used of Satan and can be channels of satanic, supernatural power. We should be careful what we have in our homes because things in our homes, we can have things in our homes which are not pleasing unto the Lord. There's one man of God, his name is Walter Butler, he came to New Zealand and he was given a Maori war canoe. They were the first inhabitants of the New Zealand, the Maoris, dark-skinned people. I was sharing before about a Maori evangelist through whom I came to the Lord and who was used greatly of God. But their, the Maori culture is involved in a lot of a lot of witchcraft, a lot of the occult, a lot of Satanism. And this man of God, Walter Butler, was given a, a canoe. And there were carvings, eyes and carvings on the bow of the canoe. And it was to protect, it was like the eyes of the gods of the sea to protect them in their, in their wars in the, in the sea. And Brother Butler did not realize all that. And God woke him up in the middle of the night and said, you get rid of that, that, that canoe or my presence will leave you. And he says, why, Lord? What's wrong? And the Lord showed him that they were, they were ungodly spirits. They were from Satan. They were satanic. He quickly obeyed and got rid of that canoe. Sometimes people have demons because of pressures in early childhood. You know, if a home is filled with fighting and swearing and bitterness and strife and everything, that does not invite the presence of the Lord. That invites the presence of evil spirits. And even pick kids in that kind of atmosphere can pick up demons of hate, demons of anger, demons of fear, demons of rebellion demons of lust, demons of suicide. You know, most people who commit suicide these days, it's, it's a demon driving them to take their lives before their time. Praying once for a lady in New Zealand, or praying once for in New Zealand, and a number of people were being delivered and there was this Fijian lady. She was an Indian. She was from Fiji. And she wanted to go on, you know, for, for the Lord. But she was aware of bondages in her life, even though she received the Lord. She had a terrible childhood. She'd been sexually abused. And her father, her, her grandfather, was a witch doctor. And... When we prayed for her, she fell down on the floor and she was twisting like a snake. And that power that she had, I mean, it took four strong men to hold her down. I mean, it was that, it was just, and she was just a small, small little lady. And, but when she fell to the ground, it was a, it was with a piercing scream and she was like a snake. And we commanded that spirit of witchcraft to come out and leave and then she just collapsed and it was just, it was just like she was dead and just fell down the limp. But, you know, she was a changed lady and she really went on for the Lord and, you know, many years later, many, many, many years later, she, she moved from New Zealand to Australia. Many years later, when we were visiting Australia, one time we met up with her and, uh, you know, she's still serving the Lord and going on for the Lord. 
Sometimes a demon can come even through an emotional shock. Sometimes if there's a car accident and people die, I mean, a person can pick up a, a spirit of fear after a terrible accident. And a child subjected to even sexual assault. And many children today, they've been sexually abused. And that's a sad situation of the generation we're living in. Sometimes it's been by their own fathers or uncles or family members. But a, a child subject to that can, can pick up a demon, an unclean spirit. We prayed one time for a nine-year-old girl. We prayed for her and she'd been, she'd been only nine years and she'd been sexually abused by eight different men. And she'd done no sin herself, but because of that, you know, a spirit of lust. And uncleanness had come into her. And, you know, we prayed and believe God set her free. So they're all reasons, different reasons, how demons can enter. But probably the main reason is the si our sins. Our sins uh, is the main reason. And we need to be careful, you know, what we say. You know, sometimes people say in a fit of discouragement, they say, you know, I wish I was dead. You know, words, there's death and life in the power of the tongue. And words like that are a direct invitation to the enemy for a spirit of death to come in. Christ became a curse for us on the cross to set us free from every curse of the law. From every curse of the law. And, you know, if somebody, if somebody lies, we tell a lie, now, that's a work of the flesh. But that doesn't mean you have a demon. But then you tell another lie. And you tell another lie. And you tell another... And there comes a point where, because of your sin, you open up the door for a demon to come in, and then you can't help lying. You're like a compulsive liar. The person get angry, gets angry. Does that mean that he has a demon of anger? Not usually. But then he gets angry again, and he gets angry again, and, again, and there comes a point that a demon of anger comes in. And, that, and that he, then he can't, like he, it's, it's, he can't help himself. And the demon of anger controls him, controls him. So through sin, when people are involved in sexual sin, you know, that opens up the door. For demons, demons of fornication, demons of adultery, demons to enter in. Areas of personality can be affected by demons. Emotions, attitudes, every negative emotion opens up the way for a corresponding demon. We've talked about rejection. If, you know, if parents do not love their, love their child, or sometimes when there's a divorce or a breakup of a close relationship, there can be demons of hate, demons of envy, demons of pride, jealousy, anger, rebellion. Now the mind is a major battlefield. The mind is a major battlefield. And some demons are doubt, unbelief, confusion, compromise, insanity. People who are in mental hospitals or hospitals, they're losing their mind. Many cases, you know, it's a demon of insanity. And the area of the tongue, guard your tongue, guard what you say. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Compulsive liars are people controlled by lying demons. In the area of the tongue, uh, other areas are uh, exaggeration, gossip, criticism, slander. And in the area of, area of sex, you know, God created Adam and Eve, sexual beings. Everything God created 
was good. And sex is something beautiful, a gift of God within one man and one wo woman who have made a covenant with each other in marriage. But there's all kinds of just sexual deviation and abuse today. Compulsive sexual behavior that, that's not normal. Even in America, it's been legalized by legalized homosexual marriages. And, and, and in places in America, pe the, the government officials are putting pressure on Christians, you know, to accept the uh, homosexuals and, and uh, you know, to perform homosexual marriages and, and things like that. Things in which are an abomination to the Lord. There's demons, demons of masturbation, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, fe feminacy. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I mean, many of them were involved in all kinds of sexual sin, but they came to Jesus. They were washed by the blood of Jesus. They were delivered and set free. They were changed. They were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they served God with all their hearts. Physical appetites. Even, you know, demons can come through appetites of lust, including, you know, alcohol, nicotine, even a spirit of gluttony, some have. So, how do, how do we get delivered? Now, Jesus, he paid the price on the cross. He became a cur He became sin for us. He had no sin, so that our sins can be forgiven. He became a curse for us on the cross to deliver us from every curse of the law. Galatians three thirteen. And it just simply as we affirm our faith in the Lord Jesus, we must humble ourselves. You know, many people I pray I have prayed for. Sometimes it's been real manifestations screaming and yelling and and and, and coughing and spitting and, and going like a snake but many other times there's been there's been maybe just a just a sigh just a cough just and other times there's been nothing discernible nothing discernible at all but nevertheless people have been set free but we can't just tell the lord well Lord, I want to be delivered, but I don't want to have any kind of manifestation. What's more important? You know, getting free or, or our dignity? I mean, if someone had fallen over a ship and, and was, was drowning and you came up and you saw somebody near, you wouldn't care. You'd just, help! You'd just yell out as loud as you could, 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 could cry for help. And so... You know, we must humble ourselves. If dignity is more important than deliverance, well, maybe we've not properly repented of areas of pride. We must confess all sin, gossip, hatred, lust, whatever it is. And also, I get people to confess the sins of our ancestors. Sometimes we know some of them, sometimes we don't. But if we know them, I get them to confess them and then to renounce them and then to pray that God will remove them from our lives, that we'll be delivered. As my wife was sharing yesterday, it's also important in deliverance to forgive. If we don't forgive other people, we're not going to be forgiven and delivered. We must unconditionally forgive those who've sinned against us. And remember, as my wife shared, forgiveness is not just a feeling, it's not just an emotion, but it is the decision of our will. I choose to forgive, no matter what the person has done to you. We must break with all false religion. And if you want to, you know, draw near to God, we must break with all contact with Satan and evil spirits and destroy things in our home to do with the occult or with the satanic like books or souvenirs or charms or objects of art or anything to do with other religions. One time I was preaching at a seminar 
and somebody came up to me and they gave me a gift. And you know what that gift was? It was a Buddha. I mean, that's the last thing we want. But we would make sure that we don't have anything connected with other religions and other, you know, false gods and false religions in our homes. And then we need to prepare to be released from every curse over our life. You know, the Bible speaks, the Bible speaks about blessings, but the Bible speaks about curses. And you know, some people, it's almost as if they're under a curse that, that everything, just everything seems to go, go wrong for them. It's a curse is like a dark shadow over our lives that, that shuts out God's blessing, or at least part of God's blessing in our lives. And sometimes, s some, some things which can indicate a curse can be when there's emotional broke bro breakdown or mental breakdown or repeated chronic sickness, especially if it's hereditary, sometimes barrenness, sometimes a tendency to miscarry or related female problems, sometimes a breakdown of marriage and family alienation, sometimes continual financial lack, now, we all go through, there's times where we go through trials financially, but sometimes where, where there's continual, you know, financial problems and lack. You know, it, can be, it, can, be, it can, be a, can be a result of a curse. That's what Malachi said, chapter 3. You're cursed with a curse. Why were they cursed with a curse? They did not pay their tithes. And instead of the blessing coming on them, the curse came upon them. And so, we're to acknowledge that Jesus, he became a curse for us. He became a curse for us so that we can be set free from every curse of the law. And so, God wants to anoint us to be deliverers. Jesus was anointed. He was anointed to deliver the captives, to set the captives free, to be to bring deliverance to those who had bondages and those who were captive to sin and to the ways of the enemy. And I believe each one of you here, God desires to anoint you so that you can be a deliverer for others. Amen? Amen? But before we close tonight, I want to pray. I want to pray for those of you here, because as I shared at the beginning, we must be free ourselves if we're going to set others free. How can we bring deliverance to others if we are not free ourselves and Romans and Acts John 8 John 8 verse 36 if the son shall make you free you shall be free indeed let's say it again if the son shall make you free you shall be free indeed now what I'm going to do is this what I'm going to do is this I can't have an older call because there's no room. But what we're going to do, I'm going to get every one of us to pray. Now maybe you've prayed already and you, you know that you're totally free. That, that's wonderful. But it's not going to hurt you to pray again. And, and who knows? You know, some of us, we don't know what some of the sins of our parents or grandparents or great grandparents or great grandparents are and we need to confess them even if we don't know what they are and renounce them and then rebuke them and cast them from having any influence in our lives. Music